Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us for today's uh, seminar in the Kirby Institute seminar series. My name is Andrew Lloyd. I'm the uh, program boss of the Viral Immunology Systems Program, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the, of the lands on which we're gathering today and to pay my respect to elders past and present. Here, from here at the Kirby, we are presenting from the Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation as the peoples in question. And I'd like to extend my respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are joining us today and to those who are the elders of all of the lands on which participants are coming from. The format for the seminar starts off with a presentation, which I'll introduce our speaker shortly, followed by Q&A. That's our traditional, but Thomas has boldly suggested that he's going to have interludes at various um, stage moments during the talk where he's very happy to take questions so you don't lose the great thought that you had in mind uh, during the talk. Um, you can ask questions by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. And for the audience in the room, I'd ask you to head across to the microphone. So it's a pleasure today for me to introduce our speaker. That's Associate Professor Thomas Tu, who's a group leader in the Viral Hepatitis Pathogenesis Lab at the Store Liver Center at the Westmead Institute for Medical Research. And Thomas is a molecular bi biologist, but particularly a molecular virologist who leads a research group at Wimmer in the store liver unit. And he's focused very much on hepatitis B. And in particular, he's interested in, uh, without getting too far into the virology, the CCC or closed circular, cl uh, covalently closed circular DNA form of the virus. For those of you who aren't already aware, Thomas will probably flag this to you. It's the key mechanism for this virus for persistence, even after apparent clearance. So it lives within integrated within the uh, uh, nucleus of uh, hepatitis B infected cells. And he's keen to measure, develop methods to measure and to eradicate that CCC DNA. And that's a key element of the potential for cure for hepatitis B. And he's keen to do this in part because he also is suffering from hepatitis B. And as part of the, his joint agenda as a scientist and as a patient, he's been a strong advocate for both of those communities for the hepatitis B sector. And because of that, he's won a whole bunch of awards. I was going to say he's won the 2022 New South Wales Tall Young Poppy Award, but actually it's the Young Tall Poppy Award, Science Award, and also the inaugural Paula, Paul and Valeria Ainsworth Precision Medicine Fellowship. So it's a, uh, I've stumbled over the introduction there, but I'm sure Thomas will be slick. And so thanks so much, Thomas, and welcome. Thanks, Andrew, for that kind uh, introduction. Um, I am going to start sharing, hopefully. Um, and you are getting used to it. Great. Thanks uh, for the introduction. And, and I'd like to start by also acknowledging the uh, digital people of the Yura Nation and pay my respects to the elders um, past and present. Um, yeah, it's great to be here at Kirby, and, and I'm going to give you a brief overview of our research um, at, at, um, at Wimmer, as well as some uh, uh, community um, engagements that we're doing. So going forward, yep. So give a brief introduction to hepatitis B. Hepatitis B sort of looks like this in a very cartoonish form. It's an enveloped virus. It's got a nuclear capsid in which there's a double-stranded DNA virus, uh, a genome. Hepatitis B is a very ancient virus. It's basically been with us for as long as we've been humans. There's real co-evolution with different species, co and, and it goes back to fish, reptiles, uh, birds, and uh, again, uh, mammalian hosts of which we're one. And there's no real species jumping that, that we can see, 
it's been real co-evolution with those hosts. And as such, it's really highly efficient. It's gotten rid of everything that it doesn't need. It's very informatically dense. Every nucleotide of its genome codes for something. And in a third of cases, a third of the genome codes for two open rating frames. So it's really nicely, high, highly dense. It's really, um, <laughs> oh, all right. Yep, no problem. So it's really common uh, infection. 300 million people around the world have a chronic infection. They have it for basically the rest of their lives. And this causes a huge amount of deaths, about a million uh, deaths annually, up to a million deaths annually. And and this is because a chronic infection uh, increases the risk of either cirrhosis or liver cancer a uh, hundredfold. And uh, people who aren't treated, about 25% of those uh, will die of that. So when you have a chronic infection, it's actually quite a complicated process. It's split up into multiple phases, as we, we call it. So when someone is exposed to hep B, it's usually from mother to child. Uh, the majority of cases are mother to child. Uh, and when that child is exposed to hep B, they, the liver is infected and nothing happens. It's an asymptomatic virus, uh, asymptomatic infection for the most part. So for the first 30 odd years, people who have hep B are uh, secreting a whole lot of virus, up to 10 to the nine per mil. Uh, and it is a non-cytolytic virus. So the liver histology looks completely normal. It's the ideal sort of state for a, a, a virus, not inducing that path pathology and producing a whole lot of itself so it can spread. At some point, the immune uh, system recognizes these hep B infected cells and starts to uh, try to get rid of it. So this uh, involves uh, CD8 uh, positive T cells, trying to uh, target and kill those cells. And this, in, in um, this as a result induces inflammation of uh, the liver. Eventually that the majority of infected cells are cleared. However, there are still some uh, infected cells that remain for unknown reasons still, uh, but uh, it's still there such that it can reactivate uh, and, and drive that liver damage. So the disease that's associated with hepatitis B is due to this persistent antiviral response. The, the virus persists in the face of this inflammation, waits till it's gone and reactivates to, and, and spreads uh, amongst the liver. And that cycle keeps happening. And that's really the driver of this um, uh, pathogenesis. Some of these patients with a chronic infection will clear the virus um, about 1% a year. Uh, and this is uh, seen as, as a seroconversion from a whole bunch of the surface antigen being expressed by, by the virus um, and that getting low enough and being replaced by antibodies against surface antigen. However, there's no therapeutic cure at the moment for this. We just have to wait for, for this to happen really. So the actual replication cycle, I'll, I'll go through this quickly. Uh, so the, the virus enters hepatocytes through uh, hepatocyte-specific uh, receptor, uh, NTCP, which is a bile acid, acid transporter. And this releases the nuclear capsid into the cytoplasm. Uh, and this relaxed circular DNA genome is then deposited into the nucleus where it's repaired and forms covalently circular uh, uh, <laughs> CCC DNA, covalently closed circular DNA, right. uh, which is better, uh, which uh, as Andrew had mentioned before is a really important part because all the viral 
transcripts, the viral mRNAs, as well as the pre-genomic RNA are transcribed from CCC DNA. It's basically a plasmid here, so episomal. The pre-genomic RNA is then encapsidated into uh, viral uh, capsids, along with the reverse trans. Uh, reverse transcriptase, the viral reverse transcriptase. And within that nuclear capsid, reverse transcription occurs and you get new circular DNA genomes and those viruses are then secreted out into um, the, the blood uh, to, to infect new cells. There is a byproduct of reverse transcription, however, where instead of relaxed circular DNA, these double-stranded linear forms are produced. And these can also be secreted as virions. And when they infect new cells, they can either form CCC DNA, but importantly to, to the work that we're doing, these can integrate into the host cell genome. And so our focuses in the lab are, are really these persistent forms, looking at HPV DNA integration and its role in liver cancer, which I'll be talking about today, um, CCC DNA, and I've stressed the importance of this form uh, and its role in, in um, chronic infection and persistence of infection. And both of these forms uh, generating or being the template for surface antigen, which again is that, that form that needs to be cleared for a, a chronic infection to be cleared because this is known to, to drive immune suppression. So once we get rid of that, um, um, we uh, get starting, we start to get clearance of these, these persistent forms as well. And so we've got sort of projects in, in all of these, but as well as that, uh, we look at how all of this affects people living with uh, chronic hepatitis B. So we, we span the whole, um, a broad spectrum of research from very molecular stuff to, to looking at the, the social science of Hep B. So today I'll be talking about, in, in my first part, uh, talking about HPV DNA integration. So this is a replication deficient form. We have our circular form, the CCC DNA, that looks like this, but in the linear form that integrates, what we have is the separation of the core promoter away from the core open reading frame. That core uh, basically forms the nuclear capsid of the virus. So if you don't produce core um, and you don't produce the polymerase, you can't get new virus uh, being generated. So that's why it's uh, replication deficient. This integration occurs very rarely, actually. Uh, it occurs in one out of 10 to the four cells. Um, and it occurs randomly at double-stranded breaks that occur in the host genome. Despite it being so rare in the hepatocyte population, the integrations are really common in tumors. So the majority of tumors in hep B patients have these integrated forms. And so there's multiple reasons that have been um, proposed to be driving this or, or be, be centered on this uh, association. One is a, basically a driving mechanism where the expression of downstream genes uh, can be driven by these um, viral promoters. And so therefore, if it's upstream of uh, pro-oncogenic uh, uh, host proteins, that can be a way. And also there are some proteins uh, in the virus genome that are associated with uh, liver cancer. So there are mutation, mutated versions of the surface protein that are known to drive ER stress and these sorts of pro-oncogenic pathways as well. So there are trans activation mechanisms that may be involved. So the major question is whether these are drivers or, or whether there are other reasons why integrations are linked to cancer. 
The way we detect integrations is using this method called inverse nested PCR. And <clears throat> this is a very sensitive way of detecting integrations. It's single copy. Um, it has single copy uh, sensitivity. Uh, and also as a, uh, is a way to sequence the actual virus cell junction. So we know where it's integrated. So the way we do this is we have our red integrated hep B DNA uh, in our black cellular DNA. And because it occurs in the random spot, uh, this downstream, uh, this, this sequence is unknown. All right, so we use a restriction enzyme to cut in a known spot in the ho uh, in the viral genome and in an unknown spot in the host genome. This is a six base pair cutter, so we know the uh, relative frequency that this will cut randomly in the host genome. So we use then uh, T4 ligase to circularize this and another restriction enzyme to cut it. So basically, what we've done is surrounded this unknown host sequence with known viral sequences. And then we can use uh, primers uh, uh, to the viral genome to, to amplify it up. We can even quantify it by using a serial titration prior to, H, uh, prior to, to, to the nested PCR. So basically we titrate it out and from there we, we know how um, um, often integration occurs. We, we can get a frequency. And when we cut it out, cut these bands out and sequence them, we can figure out whether there's repeated virus cell junctions. So that represents a hepatocyte that has undergone mitosis several times. And so you get clonal expansion. And this is a way to look at that precancerous growth that occurs. Um, because we know that any driver mutation will drive uh, clonal expansion. So we first looked at the um, when integrations occur. So we use the um, in vitro models that we uh, that that I had used in in Germany to just infect cells and figure out when these integrations occurred. No one actually actually had done this before because we lacked the models, uh, the in vitro models until maybe 10 years ago. So when we did that, we saw infection occurring um, from day five or, or virus antigens being produced from day five. But when we looked at integration, we already see these integrations even prior to, to antigen expression. So we know that integration occurs really early on in these cells, in these in vitro models. We even looked at um, these, uh, the integrations of viruses that aren't able to replicate. So uh, ones that are lacking the core open reading frame. So they won't produce new virus. Are these integrations ha happening at input or do they require uh, uh, replication and, and um, those forms coming back to the nucleus? So that's the question we, we were answering. Uh, so we've got wild type virus here and core minus virus. Uh, we confirmed that it doesn't produce new virus. We looked at the amount of CCC DNA that was there. Uh, so this is a measure of how much the cells were infected and they're pretty um, um, similar. When we looked at integration, again, completely the same. We couldn't distinguish them. So basically we show here, it's the input virus that integrates and it isn't the, uh, repli even prior to any replication that occurs. So, when we looked at integration, we knew that this was a uh, really highly sensitive uh, um, uh, technique. So we could actually use laser capture microscopy to look at what the cells look like um, down a microscope that had these integrations. And we look at surface antigen positive and surface antigen negative sort of foci in these uh, uh, liver sections. And the big numbers, the big colored numbers represent 
um, the clone size that we uh, detected in these um, in these DNA extracts from those uh, from those uh, regions. So basically, we we're seeing integrations even in normal cells, and and they don't necessarily have to be expressing the the, the virus. So the most important thing here is that they happen in histologically normal hepatocytes. When we looked at how big these clones grew, which we could uh, determine by how many integrations were repeated through the, the, the sections, we saw that they're, they're quite large. So 10,000 uh, and above uh, cells making up these clones. So there, there was this clonal expansion. And when we uh, compared this to mathematical simulations of uh, random liver turnover, we found that these were these clones couldn't just have come about by chance. They must have some sort of survival advantage. Uh, and those are the ones here. So we're now trying to understand what's driving these these clonal expansions uh, because we think that's that's driving the the pro oncogenic state so we think we we had several hypotheses one that uh, this selection advantage is driven by cis mediated mechanisms so site dependent where they're integrating into they could be happening through transmediated uh, mechanism, so maybe something that's coded by the virus itself, or maybe it's something associative and, and it's not causative. We ruled out a lot of uh, the cis-mediated mechanisms when we looked at where these integrations were happening in the uh, pre-oncogenic state, we found no enrichment in particular areas of the genome. Okay, so they match completely with our random model. We also uh, ruled out some of the, the transmediated uh, mechanisms, but now we've got a system to, to really look at that deeper. So we've been collaborating with a group in Germany who've developed this uh, fantastic model uh, uh, and maybe those of you working on other viruses, this is nothing major, that it's a reporter virus where a uh, open reading frame has been replaced with, uh, in this case, an antibiotic resistance gene. However, hep B is really touchy. You change a couple of uh, uh, nucleotides and it's replication dead. So this is really uh, quite difficult to, to achieve and it's taken many years. Anyway, we have um, used this to infect cells and select them. And basically, the, the cells that are left over um, have integrations in them. So we can basically screen a whole lot of uh, integrations and, and figure out what they do just by uh, isolating these clones and, and phenotypically uh, characterizing them. And so we were wondering, are these cells with integrations actually functionally any different? Contrary to what we thought, integration, uh, the cells with integrations actually grow slower. So this is live cell imaging data where the black uh, is the parental cells and the green, the, the cells with integrations. And on the y-axis, we've got confluence and, and time on the x-axis. So basically we can see that these cells with integrations are actually growing slower. And we didn't sort of understand that. But when we looked at uh, particular proteins associated with DNA damage and DNA repair, we found that the cells with integrations in them seem to have higher amounts of DNA damage, and that might be slowing their, their replication down. Um, and poorer induction of phospho-ATM, which is a marker of DNA repair. So what we're thinking is maybe it's backwards. Maybe cells with, an, with um, a defective DNA damage uh, 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 machinery are more likely to get integrations, but also more likely to lead to cancer. So 
in this case, we're, we're thinking that these integrations act as, as markers or, or passengers of that uh, pro-oncogenic pathway. So in conclusion for this part, we know that selective clonal expansion occurs with integrations. Well, we, uh, I didn't go through uh, much here, but we, we've uh, generated data showing that in the integration site, form and frequency in the non-tumor tissue doesn't seem to predict uh, liver cancer. And it suggests that most of the integrations don't affect the, the cell phenotype by these mechanisms. Uh, but it may be, uh, but and it's still that open question of wh why liver cancers seem to have more of these integrations than the general hepatocyte population. Uh, but we think maybe those integrations are more likely to occur in those cells with oncogenic potential. So I'll stop there um, and, and answer any questions on, on this part before I uh, move on to the, yeah, sure while everyone's thinking of their... Uh... Um, I can't remember the heart of the hypothalamus. Yes. I'm wondering about what, what that is. It's like weeks or something or days. Uh, depends. So in an uninfected, in, in a normal person um, who doesn't have liver disease, uh, it's about six months. Six months. So okay. it's really long. Yeah. And, and so the, the question linked to that was how efficiently does the integrated DNA pass from the parent hepatocyte to the progeny? Does it go to both, like both the, the progeny and, and is, is, or is it, is it biased in some direction or another? As far as we know, it'll be split between the two two cells and uh, always always because it, i mean it's it's just like a, a, the host dna it, it's basically gotcha. acting as the host dna yeah Oop. thomas uh tony kelleher hi how are you um so two questions one do you ever get integrated in ccc dna in the same cell mm, uh good question uh, so to detect integrations, um, we need a whole lot of, in this model, in the in vitro model, we need a whole lot of mitosis to occur. And the thing about CCC DNA, and we've shown this in, in other studies, is the CCC DNA is lost with mitosis. Right. So we can't so actually it's, see yeah. uh, so whether it's that not, happens. It's not replicated during the cell division. Yeah, yeah. right, right. And then I guess maybe going to that question. So uh, is there epigenetic control around, and maybe that's where you're going with this, but um, so, you know, is there epigenetic control of, of this in the integrated and is that in the epigenetics of the genes into which it's inserted or is it, or is there epigenetic control of the integrated DNA of the integrated viral DNA? Yeah. So there's definitely a epigenetic um, um, stuff happening with both CCC DNA and, and probably integrated. We, we don't know about the integrated right. yet because, again, we haven't been able to isolate enough of those right. sorts of cells to, to do those studies. But I'd imagine that the epigenetics is really different in these um, uh, cells sure. that we've selected for compared to what's actually happening. Um, yeah. yeah. So really hard right now to, to get up those questions. Okay. Mm, thanks. Thank you, Thomas. Great presentation. Uh, my question is actually on the follow-up on the discussion that we had down the stage before. Uh, you know, based on the uh, clinical data, uh, as I said, we see more happy patients with HCC without cirrhosis mm. than, uh, compared to, for example, Hep C. And uh, as you explained, the integration can explain uh, uh, this a part of that. Then what I'm uh, thinking is that then, is that correct that then the people with the functional cure, because in the integration has already happened, they are still at risk of ACC? So they definitely have integrations still when you have functional cure. Um, my understanding of the literature says they still have a higher risk of 
liver cancer compared to the never exposed population. So if you look at the core antibody positive population as negative core antibody positive, they, they're still at higher risk of HCC. And the only risk deviated from them is actually the, the, the fibrosis progression. Either fibrosis or integrations, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah so... Hmm. So this is why I think that some of this research is so important. So I, I wanted to maybe expand into non-happy stuff for a little bit, uh, but still continuing this uh, uh, theme of clonal expansion. So I, I didn't say it before, but it, it's really hard to understand liver cancer and its drivers because there's no single driver mutation that's necessary or sufficient for HCC. It's really heterogeneous uh, uh, genomically. But we think that clonal expansion could be a new biomarker because that's based on its phenotype, based on its function. Basically, all driver mutations must give some sort of survival advantage. That's sort of part of um, their definition. So that clonal expansion is necessarily necessary for HCC progression and, and possibly is a better biomarker than specific driver mutations. So I've already talked about integrations and that as a mechanism to uh, detect clonal expansion, but that only happens in, in Hep B and where there's all sorts of uh, uh, drivers of, of uh, liver disease. So we came up with or, or uh, used the concept of deleterious passenger mutations. And so this concept comes, well, well these are mutations um, that are distributed across the whole exome or genome, and they're passengers in that they're not driver mutations. So they don't, so they're unique to each patient and they don't, directly com contribute to, to carcinogenesis. And the deleterious part is that it actually causes the cell to have a lower replicative ability or survival disadvantage. And these have been actually shown to accumulate leading up to cancer, and they're there in, in higher frequency than, than driver mutations, you know, um, and 20-fold higher. And the reason why they accumulate in cancers are based on these two axioms, okay? So one, any mutation that's randomly acquired is more likely to be deleterious than advantageous. We know that just um, due to chance, right? There's only so many ways things can go right. And the other uh, thing this depends on is that the survival advantages that are driven by any uh, driver mutations are counterbalanced by this deleterious effect of, of these deleterious passenger mutations. So this is uh, uh, work from a US group uh, published in PNAS showing uh, a simulation of what should happen to a subclone when there's um, driver sweeps suddenly expands in population, but as they accumulate these deleterious passenger mutations, it evens out again until the next driver sweep. So we think that DPMs can act as the surrogates for clonal expansion. And so another way to get at this is, is the analogy of pugs. Basically, if a alien came down from you know, out of space and saw all of these pugs. These have terrible, like really bad dogs in terms of like, they've got all of these things wrong with them. Uh, they can hardly breathe, all that sort of thing. But there's so many of them. So the thought would be, there must be some driver to counteract all of this, uh, these health problems uh, associated with these dogs, because there would be no way they'd be, uh, that they could survive otherwise. And so that's basically the, the concept is the, the worse the negative traits or the, the buildup of those negative traits, the song, stronger that selection. And that's what these DPMs are. And so we've got this working hypothesis as you have uh, uh, driver mutations occur, the DPM load increases over time uh, and increases as you get to cancer. 
So we've been able to generate this uh, bioinformatics pathway uh, where we basically find the somatic mutations uh, that are occurring um, through, overlap, uh, through subtracting the overlap of mutations in different tissues of the same patient. And so we're only looking at those somatic mutations and annotate these particular uh, subsets of mutations as damaging or benign. And so the way we split these up is using uh, uh, different uh, software, including Polyphen or SIFT, uh, two different algorithms, just to make sure that what we're seeing is not um, complete rubbish. Um, so we're, we're basically scoring the missense mutations as either deleterious in terms of, uh, so these algorithms give a score of, okay, if it's highly conserved or really alters the protein structure, then it's probably deleterious, okay? Or, and if it doesn't, it's probably uh, tolerated without effect. So it's a benign. So the, the first question was uh, fairly easy using um, um, data sets that were already out there. Are DPMs increased in tumor versus non-tumor tissue? And, and we had some follow-up questions, whether enrichment specifically for DPMs, or is it an in, a general increase uh, in mutations and whether this DPM is uh, uh, accumulating independent of the actual underlying liver disease or ethnicity or, or anything else like that. So basically we use uh, uh, data sets that are out there use it, that have all the, these different etiologies, different genders, different driver mutations, uh, really heterogeneous group. And when we looked at the benign mutations, we didn't see much difference uh, in, when we looked at uh, as a percentage of total mutations, slight increase. So what we did then is normalize based on non-synonymous mutations, but because we thought the tumor is going to accumulate uh, more non-synonymous mutations. When we looked at DPMs, however, highly significant increase uh, um, and that's using this algorithm uh, called Polyphen. But when we use the other uh, algorithm, it was also increased uh, uh, using a, a different, uh, this different software. So it was fairly robust uh, sort of um, uh, uh, finding. When we looked at more recent data, so this, data set was generated in, in 2011. Sequencing um, uh, hardware has, has progressed quite a lot since then. So we have here uh, 100 times uh, mean sequence coverage uh, in uh, a Taiwanese group. So that past one was uh, French. And, and so again, different uh, etiologies. And here, the, the difference was even more stark. The, the number of benign mutations uh, really decreased in tumor and, and really increased uh, DPMs in, in the tumor. So uh, this was, was found in both uh, algorithms, but, but uh, I'm only showing the SIFT data here. So yes, these DPMs are more prevalent in tumor tissues. Uh, they are enrich, so there's specific enrichment of DPMs um, and it accumulates independent of etiology and ethnicity. Question two was, okay, we can do that with whole exome sequencing data. Maybe we can narrow down uh, what we're doing uh, to, to particular panels. And so these panels have been uh, generated based on the most frequently mutated um, um, genes in solid tumors. So this is a tenfold decrease in the, the coverage. So you can get more depth for uh, the same amount of, of sequencing. Uh, so again, the demographics here really uh, heterogeneous. And we didn't see much of a change. We could see a statistical uh, difference, but that stark difference that we saw before with 100 times as, uh, uh, depth was not as, as marked here. 
we looked at another um, um, data set with um, even deeper uh, sequencing, and we didn't, again, didn't see much difference here. So basically, um, we these mutations accumulate across the entire genome. We can't specify particular areas for it. What we did see here was um, um, patients with recurrent tumors seem to have an increased amount of, of uh, DPM. So perhaps this could be a, a novel marker for, for recurrence. And this is uh, some work that we're, we're doing at the moment um, with some new data sets. So from, from this data, we can say that we can still see the relationship uh, statistically um, with fewer genes, but uh, with uh, fewer genes uh, as a panel, um, but for prognosis purposes, probably not. So we think that these DPMs are easier to detect and define than uh, uh, driver mutations and therefore could define uh, cancer risk. For example, uh, a pathway could be you take a fine needle aspirate or something uh, or sequence the tissue upon resection and see uh, whether this patient has increased risk of HCC. Uh, and that can be used for different etiologies. And if we do find a high risk, maybe that means uh, we, we do more frequent monitoring in these uh, patients with a chronic liver infection uh, or chronic liver disease. So if we can do that and detect these liver cancers earlier, it means better outcomes. It means we can stop uh, liver cancer from being the fastest increasing cause of uh, uh, cancer deaths and, and um, might be suitable for, for cost benefit analysis if we can, if we can show that. So again, Another stop. Anyone have any questions about DPMs? Oh, Andrew, thanks. I've got it right, Thomas. The idea would be to biopsy the liver of people with chronic hepatitis B and, or any and enumerate disease. their DPMs. Mm. And and this would be prior to the advent of an HCC. Correct. So it'd be right. like a prognostic. That yeah. We're getting up there in the DPMs. Yeah. Um, there is a bit of a trouble in, you know, in clinical practice in that we generally no discourage biopsy. biopsies from um, patients with chronic B, especially if they're cerotic and nodular, okay. um, because if it is an HCC, then in theory, you spread the yeah. tumor down the needle tract. Yeah. It's just a little practical Difficulty there. Yeah. So um, what we're looking to do, um, and, and currently we have a, a, a fund, a NHMRC funding for this, is is doing uh, fine needle aspirates, which are uh, a bit easier to do than a biopsy, um, and a bit less painful for for the patient. Um, and from that small amount of uh, um, tissue thank you whoever whispered that um we we can do the same thing um but again sorry uh, i i mean we wouldn't be uh targeting the the liver cancer we're looking at the non-tumor tissue just you can't quite tell yeah sure sure um again these are ultrasound guided still but um yeah you can you can't tell. Uh, I mean, we're, we're also thinking of ways whether this can be measured in the serum as well. Um, we've been working with Syro, who have a uh, way of looking at um, cell-free DNA that's liver-specific, that's uh, coming around in, this, uh, floating around in the serum. So the last part, is some of our work with uh, Carla Trelaw uh, on, on in UNSW here. Uh, and, and this is more the, the uh, sort of community aspects. So uh, I myself was diagnosed when I was this old, about 14 years old, uh, with chronic hep B. So when I was told, 
I sort of had this panic response. I didn't really know what was happening. Um, it was very, very emotional for me. Get told that you have this for the rest of your life and you're not allowed to spread it. So you can't do all these things. Um, and later on, finding out that it's a cause of liver cancer and all of that sort of thing. Um, and it's a sort of shameful thing. Uh, it, and so you're left on your own. You can't really talk to other people about it. Uh, otherwise, you, you sort of look, you know, there's this stigma and discrimination associated with, with chronic hep B. Uh, I personally um, um, decided to publicize my status because of those experiences I had um, as a kid because that stigma and discrimination silences people. And um, yeah, it's, it's just harder to connect to others when, when people stay silent about their status. And, and when that happens, you have apathy, people don't get monitored, people have, um, and have poorer health outcomes because of it. So basically it, it sucks going through it alone. Um, it's hard to navigate that information, what information is out there. You Google Hep B and, and you get all of these promises of cures, supplements, all of this sort of thing. How can you say that that's true and, and other uh, websites are uh, inaccurate? It's hard to know who to trust, hard to feel understood. And it's easy to think things are worse than they are and easy to be led by that fear of uh, disease progression and therefore easy to do nothing about it. And so what we've been doing is developing, uh, uh, two and a half years ago, developing a community-led online forum where we basically have, uh, it's, it's free to use, anyone can join. And the important part is we build trust um, for people who are scientific or, or health experts, we give them a little verified badge and make sure that, and so show that the information coming from these people actually is an informed source. And we think it's a really win-win-win resource. The affected community gets this access and gets to connect with other people having those same experiences. And, and so are building those connections and, and facilitating that advocacy, because if you're stuck alone, there's no way to build that um, um, critical mass that you need to change things. It actually helps some, some health professionals. We've even, um, one, by, by seeing that there are people out there believing different things outside of their consults. They can see what concerns they have, what misinformation is around, what kind of issues people are having that stop them from accessing care. Uh, they can refer to uh, this, this forum so that they know that there's this patient support outside these consults. And it actually helps uh, uh, health professionals themselves. We've had nurses and um, um, health professionals from all over the, the world ask questions specifically about Hep B to, to get um, um, information right uh, in their phone. And it helps researchers and scientists. And, and um, one, I, I personally find it useful just to see the broad number of issues that patients face in different um, um, scenarios that are outside my own experience and require addressing. Uh, we've also used it to emphasize surveys and, and trials. So um, it can be useful in that respect as well. So after about two years, we've got uh, 1500 global members. We've got uh, quite a few page views. Um, basically, we support on-demand conversations with experts, and we've uh, currently got a showcase happening at the moment uh, where we've, we've got like $2,000 uh, of, of sponsored prizes. Basically, scientists from all over the world in the HEP-B space write a couple of uh, paragraphs, and basically it gives hope to the patient seeing that, okay, all of these different people are working on different aspects of Hep B because they don't usually get to see that. 
And so what we're doing now is basically building awareness, uh, uh, supporting multiple languages. We've already got a Vietnamese subforum, and we've actually now uh, working on a survey to find barriers to care, and that's been funded by Gilead. So basically, this uh, um, um, work has has been done with multi partner engagement from people all over, over the world. Um, and and yeah, happy to take any questions on on that. Thanks. Oh yeah, sure. I can't check online because so to start the ball rolling for questions, uh, Thomas. I my limited involvement in um, sort of consumer website. Uh, management is that there is a bit of a trick about the decision about whether to filter some mm. of the content that comes on yeah either that's notionally science or complete pseudoscience or opinion from consumers that you think are a bit too left field yeah what do you what do you do about that? yeah so this is a great question we've had people on there denying that um hep b is caused by viruses and to and this was from someone with hepatitis B. He was an engineer. He actually seemed pretty smart, right? And said he wouldn't accept the diagnosis unless he got an EM of the, his blood to show the, the virus. And, and, you know, the best thing you can do with that is address it and, and say these are the evidence behind blah, 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 blah. Um, and you may not um, convince that person, but, you know, this is a free-to-view uh, website and other people having those same doubts may be um, um, convinced, right? And that's probably the best you can do. So does that mean you, you don't filter, actually? Uh, for the most part, we haven't filtered. Yeah, and and so far, what what, what about the so far? Which... People have been quite um, respectful, and um, under I think this comes from I guess the unique position that I'm in as someone with Hep B, but also with the connections and understanding from the expert community. People mm. see me as someone who has skin in the game. You know, mm. I. I am with them in terms of having happy as well. So I want the best for, for them as well. Mm. Um, that seems to be a key in, in terms of uh, speaking as, you know, respectful sort of conversation. What we also do is uh, people who have been quite engaged in the forum, we sort of promote them as uh moderators and and people so we're, we're taking people from the community to run the community right and and it's that bottom up um um sort of approach that has helped us you know maintain this positive environment and keep the pseudoscience stuff to a minimum actually but i think it's worthwhile that we need to address these because these issues um because people aren't getting good information otherwise they're, they're all in their bubbles fantastic any other questions either online or or uh, face to face uh thomas win uh, can you elaborate more on how the forum works what about future directions regarding the vietnamese community um, so yeah so we actually currently have the vietnamese community um, active uh, we have a project manager who's a native speaker in, in Vietnamese, so that, that helps a lot. Um, how the forum works, you basically have your email, you register with just an email, and you can post online and ask questions. Um, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's basically how it goes. And do you, do you facilitate interchange? Yeah. So anybody can respond, so to speak. Yeah. So so anyone can respond. Um, 
but we try to guide the the conversation in particular when people are asking about oh what do these lab results mean mm. the moderators there who aren't experts are pretty much the front line and saying oh welcome to the forum um an expert will be here soon to to like uh, give you some some mm. advice about it um and that sort of primes people to only look for the people with the with, with the verified badges mm. rather than any old person can i change topic and just ask you one oh, more yeah, question sure. Thomas? I, I, you, you mentioned that you personally had felt um uh quite uh, uh significantly the stigma associated with having chronic hepatitis b yeah um you know, my work is mostly on hepatitis C and yeah. where the mode of transmission across the globe is dominated by people who inject drugs. Yeah, sure. And so there's a sort of a natural stigma about how that uh, might be assumed to have been acquired. Yeah. But if you make the same analogy with chronic hepatitis B, where it's transmitted yeah. vertically, yeah, that, that it should not be. It should stigmatized. not be. Yeah. So what, 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 what do you make of that? Well, I mean, even even here it's linked to STIs. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and that has driven the, the stigma significantly. Uh, we know of some people with um, um, Hep B on the forum who got diagnosed as part of um, prenatal screening and their partner left them because they thought they, they cheated on them. Or, or so some of that must be sort of ignorance driven, don't you think? Right, right. And, and you know, that lack of information does is present in the the general population but also comes in some aspects from the health providers themselves as well so it we have seen um a lot of misunderstandings of where hep b has so it gone. just makes me wonder about a, a direction for the forum as being education yeah you know to reduce ignorance exactly. and, and also it, it again strikes me too it's an eminently preventable condition yeah and so with vaccination and so th that just says if you know it was crazy for that partner whoever it was to leave yeah they just got to get immunized yeah 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 and exactly and and we have a specific sub uh, a thread for you know how do you negotiate relationships when you're happy positive or one person is happy positive and that's a major theme that mm. we try to push once you're vaccinated that's fine you can even have unprotected sex and and have kids mm. um and and still be protected um and that's one thing at a time i mean that stigma and discrimination isn't going away anytime soon i think i mean uh and so part of it has been spillover from hep c so people yeah. just see viral hepatitis or hepatitis b think it's hepatitis c and all that sort of thing um and so really this this uh forum the the major role is circumventing that stigma being able to discuss it without fear of of that stigma from mm. other people because you know this is a welcoming space people understand where where they're coming from right so i think that's the the major value of this and and a lot of the stigma will just start to go as you know older people with the uh sort of locked in prejudices against mm. these infections um sort of no, there's nothing new more online thomas is there is that that's old is it that one uh no that one's new thank you very much for if the results of this study could be linked somehow to treatment opportunity and initiatives uh presumably you're you're talking about the barriers to care yeah um so the, the major thing for the barriers to care uh, work is just finding out whether our response, uh, our societal response is, is targeting the right points of, um, of the cascade to care and all that sort of thing to get people, you know, diagnosed, treated and, and monitoring. So that definitely does um, um, factor into to what we need to do uh, in terms of society and the public health response. 
Thanks so much, Thomas. Um, uh, I think we've come to time. So let me please join me in thanking Thomas for really was a, a, a wonderfully interesting discourse between state of the art, cutting edge molecular virology through to public advocacy. So it's, a, it's an inspiration, Thomas. Thank you so much. Thank you.